Hello, I am that British guy and welcome to my Battleground Roundup. Now before I go through the card and see how well I predicted it, wasn't it a weird way of booking a show? There were quite a few moments here that just didn't really seem to make sense. We'll get to them as we go through, so let's start right at the beginning with the kickoff match between Aiden English and Ty Dillinger. Now normally in these matches it is quite commonplace for the face to get the win over the heel just to start the crowd off on a high. They didn't do that. Aiden English got the win over Ty Dillinger and okay, fair enough I suppose. It's been a while since Aiden English actually got a victory. He's been beaten quite a few times by Ty Dillinger so it was quite nice for him to get that win over him here and I don't think it's really going to hurt Ty Dillinger too much in the long run. I just hope we don't get the back and forth between these two, certainly on pre-show matches for the foreseeable future. I want to see Ty Dillinger doing something else with other superstars on the roster, please. The show started proper with The New Day and The Usos for the Tag Championships, and this had to be the match of the night, to be honest. Xavier and Kofi were absolutely brilliant together and this is one of the best showings I think I've ever seen from the Usos. These two teams just work really, really well together. Yeah, it was high flying, it was hard hitting, both teams looked like they left absolutely nothing behind. This seemed to be the sort of spectacle of the feud if you like, the, the high point. And it was just weird that it happened now, not at SummerSlam, which is one of WWE's biggest pay-per-views. Surely it would have been better for the Usos to sneak a win again or just sneak away with the titles and then have this big celebration with the crowd at SummerSlam where it would have got a huge pop from the crowd, I'm sure. And New Day could have come out on top at a much bigger show. But that's not how it got booked. New Day won here in a very, very good match. Hopefully these two teams will still go into SummerSlam for one final match. Just to see overall who can beat who. Um, yeah, there's not really much more to say other than that, to be honest. Apart from it was a bit weird that it happened at a B pay-per-view rather than not one of the biggest ones in the whole calendar year but there we go next up we had Shinsuke Nakamura versus Baron Corbin and the match never really got going did it Nakamura hit Corbin with some quite hard hitting moves early on and Corbin managed to sort of overcome that initially and and be a bit of a powerhouse but there was no big moment in the match considering they were gonna end it on a disqualification there was no attempt at a kinshasa at least not that i saw there was a deep six i think was the biggest move in the whole match and then baron corbin low blows shinsuke and then beats him down after the match not burying nakamura but certainly not showing him in the biggest of lights for a newer audience and i'm sure there were quite a few people watching this that aren't aware of what he's done in nxt and aren't aware of what he did over in japan before he came here they just see him as some new guy who kicks people a lot and he never really got a chance to show the real him in this match. So whether this carries on into SummerSlam or not, maybe they tease putting the briefcase on the line just to make it a bit more important, but I can't see why Corbin would do that. It's just very, very weird way of, of booking it. Yeah, Nakamura got the win, but he got it in the lamest possible way. The Fatal 5-Way Elimination Match for the right to challenge Naomi at SummerSlam for the women's title. And I finally got one right! Yay! Uh, this, to be honest, although the end was very, very frantic, it was just elimination after elimination after elimination, 
before that, it looked like they were trying to tell quite a lot of stories going forward. There was the whole Lana Tamina thing sticking with each other and Tamina breaking up the Disarma quite a few times so that Lana wouldn't tap out, causing Becky to need to eliminate Tamina first before she got rid of Lana, which was quite nice. There was sort of everyone basically teaming up on Natalia and her trying to fight her way through everyone, which again was very interesting. She's kind of isolated herself since the whole welcoming committee thing so that was quite nice to see a little different dynamic there of her sort of lone figure fighting for herself there was elements of Becky and Charlotte sort of teaming up in order to take out Lana and Tamina but ultimately when it, they needed to they realised that what was more important was to fight each other for the right to face Naomi, which was very nice. Not exactly dissension or a split up of the friendship, but realising that we need to put that to one side because we've got a job to do here. So that would be quite nice, hopefully going forward, those two and Tamina and Lana potentially. And yeah, Natalia came out and on top and will face Naomi at SummerSlam. And I have a feeling... She will win, and immediately Carmella will come in and cash in her briefcase. I'm calling that now. It'll be interesting to see how the booking goes forward, and whether I'm way off the mark by the time I do my SummerSlam predictions, but early on, that's what I feel is going to happen. Kevin Owens and AJ Styles for the US Championship. Now, this just reeks of weird booking, really. So... Kevin Owens defends the title successfully against AJ Styles, albeit because AJ Styles gets counted out at Backlash. Then, obviously, we had the whole Money in the Bank thing, so it kind of gets put on ice. Then AJ Styles wins a match to be the number one contender for Battleground, but wins the belt before Battleground to go into Battleground as champion. So Kevin Owens is a number one contender and then they immediately give the belt back to him. Um, yeah, that just sort of screams of double swerve, I guess, because you don't expect a title change to happen on a house show. But then if you're going to give the belt straight back to Kevin Owens at the next available opportunity, what was the point of any of it? I presume this is building towards a final match between the two of them again at SummerSlam. And this will be put to bed there. But yeah, what a weird way of booking the feud. It was an okay match. I kind of feel like both guys were kind of working in sort of third gear rather than going full throttle. It, it was nice in parts but nothing really blew me away the ending was weird the ref being down and and both guys trying to lock in submissions and then the ref comes round and it looked like AJ was holding Kevin Owens in a submission but Kevin Owens managed to sort of tilt him over so that his shoulders were on the mat and he got counted because he looked confused afterwards and didn't make any attempt to try and kick out and it didn't look like he was sort of out for the count either. It was just a really odd way of, of ending the match, to be honest. Whether that then leads into a kind of who is the undisputed champion and they kind of vacate it until then, I don't know. But yeah, very, very odd way of, of booking the whole thing, really, from backlash onwards. It kind of feels like, as I said earlier, a double swerve for the sake of it. But there we go. Next up, John Cena and Rusev in a Who Loves Their Country More in the Whole Wide World match. Uh, yeah. The thing I really didn't like about this, and it wasn't anything from either of the guys, was the fact that people were booing the Bulgarian flag. They weren't booing Rusev as the heel. They were just booing the Bulgarian flag and presumably Bulgaria. And... I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that probably most of the people in the crowd don't even know what Bulgaria is or that it's even a country. I realise that's probably going to annoy a fair few people, but there we go, I've said it now. Yeah, the bits in the ring were quite good and the bits at the ramp were quite good, but the whole getting up there and you drag me along and I'll hold you back and God, it was slow. It would sort of Nice, frantic, fast-paced bits in the ring, really pummeling on each other. We know these two work well together anyway. They've worked with each other a 
hell of a lot over the last couple of years, but this just, oh, it was just full of slow. Why put the posts where the flags need to go so far away from the ring? Did they have to walk all the way up the ramp? Was the only point of doing that so that you could AA Rusev through the double tables, but then you could have done that from the steps if the steps were nearer to the ring, or you could have even done it from the apron of the ring if you needed to to get that spot why not just have the flags maybe need to go in the opposing flagpole or one just outside the ring why on earth did they have to go all the way up the ramp it was just tedious and because there was no real feud between the two of them apart from america and bulgaria whoever they are remember um it would yeah Considering at Great Balls of Fire you had the ambulance match, which was a fairly similar premise of slowly go up the ramp to a thing at the top of the ramp, because there was actually history between Strowman and Reigns, there was a bit of investment. But because there was nothing between these two guys, at least not recently, it was just so pointless and just a reason for John Cena to come back and go, I'm great, America's great, here's a flag. Sami Zayn and Mike Kanellis faced each other in a rematch from last week's SmackDown Live. And in classic WWE booking, we get 50-50 booking at his finest here. Mike Kanellis wins his SmackDown debut and then loses the next match against the same opponent. So they're one for one against each other. What on earth was the point of the match at SmackDown? I know I said this in the predictions video. What was the point? They could have just had another backstage segment. This could have been Mike Kanellis' in-ring debut at a pay-per-view, and then he could win there. That makes more sense. Having him face Zayn the week before and win, great, he's winning his debut match, and then he's coming straight out of his first pay-per-view since he first appeared at Money in the Bank and just kind of stood there, his first actual match in front of a pay-per-view audience, and he loses. What on earth are you doing? But, well, there we go. It was kind of shades of repeats of that match with Maria trying to get involved and trying to prevent the halluva kick and bits in the corner but i really hope they don't just trade wins back and forth to SummerSlam. it would be nice to see something else happen to be honest what would be quite nice is if they after all this have to kind of become reluctant allies to face off against a bigger threat but i've got no idea who that bigger threat is there's no tag teams or groups or anything in smackdown apart from the usos and the new day and they'll be facing each other for the titles apart from maybe the ascension but who they could probably the way the ascension had been booked either one of these guys could probably beat those two in a handicap match anyway but that's a completely different matter moving on to the main event we have jinder mahal versus randy orton in the best position Punjabi prison match in the history of Punjabi prison matches mainly because the other two were really really bad this wasn't too terrible to be honest it a lot of people have been ragging on the whole Jinder project they've been ragging on the whole oh my god we've got another Punjabi prison match apart from the fact that at times it was very difficult to see what was going on and it must have been hell on earth for the crowd which is probably why they were so damn quiet for most of it it was quite a good match, I suppose. The Sings just magically appearing and pulling Jinder through that last door. That was quite inventive, I suppose. Um, then Brandy Orton just going on a pummeling spree and taking out those two whilst trying to fight Jinder Mahal off. And even up until that point, what they were doing in the ring was quite nice. It looked quite personal between the two of them. It looked quite hard-hitting. I think the the main thing is the predictability of the four doors because you always know that something is going to happen at door four. One to three is always going to be open the door and oh no, you've just not quite made it out there. You've just run out of time. Never mind. There's always the next door. And then the fourth door is either one person just manages to escape and the other one gets left in the ring, but then he's free to just climb the structure anyway. Or they both just quite miss out and then they have to kind of escape like it's a cage match. The only problem with the whole they drag Jinder out and then he climbs the second structure is Randy Orton's left inside the first structure to climb up it without any hindrance at all. And he's able to then jump, as we've seen a couple of times now, from the first structure to the second structure. And then he's nearly out. 
He's then ahead of Jinder, and then he kind of realises, oh, I nearly won this match. I better kind of climb down a bit and then make sure I don't climb over the top when he logically could just go, oh, I'm nearly at the top of this one. Over I go because you're nowhere near me. I'm round the corner. And then, oh, drop down, win. But obviously he didn't do that because Jinder needed to win. And he won because the great Kali's back. Yay. Oh, dear. Yeah. Does this mean that Randy Orton's going to be facing the Sings and the great Kali for a, the right to face Jinder yet again at SummerSlam? Because I really, really hope not. I really, really hope that this is the end of this feud. There's nothing more these guys can do with each other. Jinder needs to beat someone else. He's beaten Randy Orton out at three pay-per-views. He needs to move on. If it's going to be against John Cena at SummerSlam, like it's rumoured, fine. As long as he wins, which he probably won't. But there we go. But he needs something different now, please. Please, and the great Kali coming in is not going to change the dynamic enough for this feud to feel fresh, especially as he's just going to be the bodyguard of the champion. But he's already got two lackeys anyway, so yeah, it doesn't change that dynamic in any way possible. So here is the match card in full, and here are my predictions. And this is whether I managed to predict the matches right or wrong. As you can see, I managed to predict four of the matches correctly and four incorrectly, so not quite as good as Great Balls of Fire, unfortunately. But there we go, what can you do? A lot of that, I personally think anyway, is to do with illogical booking. The New Day not winning at SummerSlam, they win the titles now, is a bit odd. The whole Kevin Owens, AJ Styles, let's just kind of double swerve everyone for the sake of it that was weird and the 50-50 booking of Sami Zayn and Mike Kanellis is just uh I suppose I should have seen that coming because WWE are renowned for 50-50 booking but I honestly didn't think they were going to give Mike Kanellis his first pay-per-view match and make him lose it but there we go shows how highly they think of him I suppose but hey so, how did you do in your predictions? Did you manage to get more than me? I'm guessing you probably did, because I didn't do particularly well there. Please give the video a thumbs up if you like it, and subscribe to the channel. As I said in my predictions video, I will have my next booking video coming up later this week. I do still have the poll open on Facebook if you want to give me your suggestions for future booking videos. I'll be happy to look through those and see what you think I should book. Thank you very much for listening. I have been That British Guy and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.